Hello viewers and uh, welcome to another episode of Reminiscences. Today we are in the home of Dr. Adamu Mohammed Fika, who is a retired uh, permanent secretary, uh, having worked for many years uh, in Maiduguri, in a northeastern state, as permanent secretary, before he moved to the federal service, where he continued at a senior level, became permanent secretary in many ministries, or director general, as it was sometimes called, and then later on became the clerk of the National Assembly, uh, when the transition to civil rules uh, started to happen. Uh, after that stint, he ended up actually as the executive chairman of the National Assembly Service Commission. So he has seen various levels of service, both at the regional or state level to the federal level. So I'd like to welcome you to Reminiscences. Thank you very much. And to ask you to take us through your early years. I know you were born in uh, Fika. I was born in Fika. And then you studied also there. Yes. Yes. I was born in 1942 at Fika, in Fika, local government of present day Yoga State. Right. However, when I was born, we were still in Borno State, right. or Borno Province, in fact, so right. to speak. And we were part of the Northeastern States. Right. But I did my primary education at Fika from 1948 to 1952. Then I moved from there to Potterscombe Senior Primary School right. from 1953 to 55. And thereafter, I was admitted to Barewa College. How did that happen? Because Barewa then was the premier college in northern Nigeria. Was it, was it a competitive process that took you there? It was a very competitive process. Mm. And the interview, actually, for the selection were for Borno province, who were all in Maiduguri, mm. where an expatriate education officer, senior education officer, interviewed us. And in the end, five of us were selected. From Borno province? From Borno province. Will you remember some of the five? I can remember all of them. Yes. There was uh, Ali Maraki, Ibrahim Alkari, myself, Al Haji Umar, and Mahmoud Ahmed, mm. Ambassador Mahmoud Ahmed, mm. who is still alive. Yes. Yeah. So five of us were on Borno. So you went, went to Barewa. Yes. Which is, of course, far away from where you are. I mean, far away from Borno. Yes. This was in uh, Zaria? Zaria, yes. Right. How, how, was, how was the experience? How were you traveling to go to Barewa in those days? We traveled to Barewa most of the time by public transport, mm. by lorry. Mm. And it was very adventurous, mm. especially in the rainy season, mm. when it took about 10 days. Ten days from Portiscum to reach Zaria. Because at that time, whenever it rains, the trunk road was closed for twenty-four hours. Mm. If you are not lucky, before twenty-four hours, another rain will fall. Yes. Then the road will again be closed for another twenty-four hours. So there is no specific time for arrival. Mm. So and usually during the rainy season, it took a minimum of ten days to reach Zaria. So why were you sleeping this all this time? You are young boys then, yes, going to school. So why, where will you be sleeping and eating? You are in these long stops. Well, <coughs> the Lord we were stopping in a village, mm. and we had our mats. Mm. Yeah. We, we put it down under the car with your wooden box mm. as your pillow. You sleep. Sometimes you sleep in the lorry itself mm. when it is raining. Mm. But it was for us young men. It was a real adventure. Mm. Those five years. Mm. 
because coming back home, we used to go by train, mm. often from Zaria via Kafanchang to Jos, mm. or from Zaria to Kano, and then complete the rest by road, mm. which we really enjoyed it. Mm. And How long uh, would that take the tra once the train service was available? The train service from Zaria to Jos took overnight. Mm. We set off maybe around five, six in the evening from mm. Zaria. Mm. We arrived just around 5 a.m. Mm. the following morning, mm. you know. And to Kano, it took some, some hours only. Mm. But we enjoyed it whichever way. Yeah. And yeah. Wherewa is a very elitist school. Yes. I mean, uh, is it a very sharp contrast from your life in Potaskum? To be in Zaria and in, in, with this, uh, in, in, in this elitist uh, school in, in uh, where all the young northern boys were put together. Yes, because we had then six houses at Barewa College, mm. and we were all shared to the various houses, mm. and there you meet your classmates for the first time, mm. and those senior to a year or two for the first time. Mm. And we are shared into about five students per room. Mm. And that's how we normally go to classes mm. starting from seven, mm. where there will be a parade. Mm. After that, you go to the classes until breakfast at nine o'clock. Mm. Then there after you go back to school and continue schooling until about one, one thirty, then you go to pray, mm. the lunch. Mm. The afternoon rest, and then games in the evening. Mm. Was the food good? Was it the food was, was, was excellent. Mm. Better than what we, we enjoyed in our respective homes, mm. really. Yes. And it was three square meals every day. Mm. So it was a pleasure. Yeah. And after privilege. Barewa, sorry, after yeah. Barewa, you went to Kefi. Yes. Again, that's another long way from Borno. Yeah. Uh, how was the experience in Kefi? I think this was for higher school certificate. For higher school certificate. Right. Yes. Because it was the policy of the Northern government then to reshuffle students. Even though HSC started in Barewa mm. well, before I finished Form 5. Mm. But the government decided I should go to Kefi mm. to do my HSC. Mm. While some from Kefi or Iloren, mm. Sokoto, etc., will come to do their own at Barreo College. Mm. That is one way of expanding the experience mm. of the younger elites as they grow up. Mm. And at Kefi, you also met a new fresh set of people. Mm. There was an arts class where mm. we were only 11, mm. and then a science class, mm. which was bigger. They were up to 20 plus. Mm. But we did it two years. And then when we finished, we set for the final exams. Mm. Luckily, I passed all my papers with flying colors. Mm. How come you went to Makerere University, Uganda, for your degree? It was just, I would should say, my luck. Mm. Because when I finished at Kefi, mm. December 1962, mm. I went straight to Kaduna, mm. where I had Later I heard of service, and Secretary of the Interim Common Services Agency. Mm. And also, your namesake, also, yeah, my namesake. A lot of people, this is yeah, Ademofika, yes, he comes to mind. All. Mm. So, he gave me, I was at that time, he was a palm sec or he was a senior civil servant by then. He was the principal mm. of the Federal Training Center, Kaduna. Kaduna, okay. So, he gave my job as an assistant instructor. Mm. It is from the Federal Training Center that I went for the interview of the Northern Nigeria Scholarship Board. Mm. So they offered me a scholarship to go to ABU, mm. which had started one year earlier. Yes. I said, no, I want to go to Ibadan, 
where I will study history as a single honor subject. Mm. At ABU, you have to study two subjects. Right. And I said that was not appealing to me. Mm. And the secretary said, the Northern Nigeria government will not give me a scholarship to Ibaran. And I said, I will not go to ABU either. Mm. So I went back to my teaching. How are you so determined to go to Ibadan? I mean, this exchange between you and the scholarship uh, secretary. Yes, I wanted to be a teacher of history. And I thought any other subject would distract me from my area of interest. Mm. And the secretary was unyielding. Mm. So I went back to my teaching. Mm. Until about July 1963, mm. when Arsene Labo, then the secretary of the scholarship board, phoned the principal, mm. Arhaji Arbifika, mm. to say, why is there a troublesome <laughs> younger brother? He said, he's here teaching. Mm. He said, OK. I think about two days ahead, he said, the registrar of Makerere University was coming to interview students to go to Makerere to study on U.S. aid scholarship mm. for teachers in Nigeria. Mm. So if he is interested, he should come. Mm. So, 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 and so on, that, on, the, on, the, on the day in question. Mm. So I took that opportunity and attended the interview mm. and two of us were selected mm. from Northern Nigeria. Mm to go to Makerere, mm. myself, and one Shitu Alimi. From Shitu? Shitu Alimi, Alimi. from Kebi, Kaba province. Okay. So we set up to Makerere. Mm. So how, how was it? Here you were from Potoskum, northern Nigeria. Yes. Finding yourself in uh, Kampala. Well, Kampala was the, in, the, in the 1960s. Yes, well, I was in fact the only house speaking fellow. Mm. In the whole of all the Nigerian students, there was another group before us yes. who were 25. But I was the only house speaking. Mm. The rest are either Igbo speaking or Yoruba speaking mm. or other languages. Mm. But I was able to adjust properly because those senior to us, mm. especially when those that were in the same hall, mm. they took me as a younger brother, mm. particularly one called Ukeje Eloagu, mm. who is now about 92 mm. in age, mm. and uh, Ralph Eboje mm. from Midwestern State. Mm. Those two just treated me like a younger brother. Mm. And so I quickly settled down mm. and I enjoyed my studies because mm. After the first year, where we studied three subjects mm. English, history, and geography. Mm. I then concentrated on history only mm. from the second year to the third. Yeah. How uh, is life in Uganda compared to Nigeria, where, where you came from at that time? At that time, mm. we well, about the same level of mm. development. And the good thing is, they used shillings mm. as their currency, mm. while we used the pounds. Mm. And when we received allowances, I think the Nigerians had the highest allowances of all students. Mm. So we found life was really very enjoyable. Mm. With all the scholarships paid, mm. plus pocket money, mm. to go along with it. Mm. So. We had no problem whatsoever mm. until we finished and graduated after three years. Did you travel? Did you mix with people in Uganda? Did you make friends? I made friends. Mm. I traveled in Uganda, mm. particularly to northern Uganda. Mm. I also traveled to Kenya, mm. especially the country of the Luo, mm. with some friends. Mm. So well, we really enjoyed it. Yeah. And after graduating, when I was in Kericho, I visited Nairobi, in other places, mm. several times. So after graduating from Makerere University, you taught for a while in, in Kenya. In Kenya, yes. Yeah, well, why, why, why did you choose to do that? I chose it because at the time I finished my examinations, 
and I could come to Nigeria was March 1966. And the coup had just happened about two and a half months earlier. January. So there was, the papers and magazines were full of uncertainty and anxieties about Nigeria. Mm. So I felt it wouldn't probably be safe mm. to return home. Mm. So instead, I opted for the job in Kenya, mm. where I taught there for about eight months. Mm. Before, in October, I came back to Nigeria to join the staff of Ahmad Berle University, mm. but based in Abdullahi Bahari College, which was then in Kano, mm. but a campus of Ahmad Berle University, Zaria. Yeah. Yeah. When you are moving from Uganda to Kenya to teach, why did you have a family at that point? No, I did not have a family. You are still a young married person. I was person. still a young married person. Mm. But three or four days before I left Uganda for Nigeria, mm. I got married to a Ugandan who was then a student in the equivalence of a teacher's college, mm. advanced teacher's college. Mm. She was still a student there. Mm. So I got married to her. Mm. So by the time I came to Nigeria, I was a married man. Mm. You, you came back together? No, she, mm. I left her to finish her studies mm. before she would join me. Right. Yes. Mm. So like you said, you, were, you came to Bahero, you know, well, uh, affiliate of ABU then. Yes. And you were there for quite a while. Yes. Teaching before going abroad again. Yes. Yeah, was this was this a kind of uh, another scholarship you got, or is on your own that you went to, I believe, the UK for for further studies? No, it was uh, still uh, another scholarship. Yes. Because when I started teaching in 1966, right, I registered for a master's degree, mm. and now up under the late Professor Abdullahi Smith. Mm was the head of the history department mm. at Amr Bello University. Mm. There I did two years. Mm. And I had nothing to show for it. Mm. Towards achieving the master's degree. Why? What do you mean? So you didn't make progress in those two uh, years? I was young. I did, I did not make progress. We were mm. young. We spent a lot of our time mm. in other social activities rather mm. than studies. Mm. Besides, my supervisor is was in Zaria mm. while I was in Kano. Right. So there was a problem. Mm. I just could not make much headway mm. towards achieving a master's degree. Right. So I booked an appointment to see the registrar, mm. the late Professor Ishaya Audu. Mm. Was it the registrar or the vice chancellor? The vice chancellor. Right. So luckily, he gave me an appointment. Mm. So I narrated to him my predicament mm. that before I, it is concluded that I am unproductive, mm. I am not brilliant, mm. I need his assistance mm. to be able to pursue a postgraduate studies mm. outside the country, mm. if possible. The vice chancellor, to my surprise, said, Well, if you can get a school uh, a, a remission in any university in the UK or US, mm. I will get you a scholarship to go and study. Mm. I said, okay. So I applied to mm. so many universities. Many American universities and British universities gave me a remission. Mm. And I chose to go to School of Oriental and African Studies. University of London. University of London. So I informed the VC. And uh, he, I don't know, he had his, the man was a wonderful leader. Mm. He just made his telephone contract with some people. And apparently I got a Ford Foundation scholarship through the Institute of, Institute of International Education mm. in New York. Mm. So they gave me a scholarship, full scholarship. And I, there I just packed my things. By that time, my wife had arrived from Uganda right. about two or three months earlier. Right. So we headed for London. Mm. Well, the scholarship was very generous. Mm. And also, 
they allowed me three quarters of my salary monthly in Nigeria. So if I run short of cash mm. in UK, I always went to the ABU London office and signed a check of say a hundred pounds, mm. uh, pound and the UK pound was by the same, a mm. par. So it was. So how was life uh, in London for a young uh, scholar at that time? So it was very, very interesting and very time consuming mm. because my main place of study was the public records office. Mm because I was decided to study Kano history. Mm. And most of the references are in that place. Mm. And you have to be in the queue or in the line mm. by 7 a.m. Mm. And the, because the seats available are only about 17 or so. Mm. So every morning you have to be racing mm. to reach the gate of the public records office. Mm in order to be able to be allowed to enter for study mm. from, say, 8 o'clock until 5 p.m. every day. Mm. And I really enjoyed it mm. because either, either bus or train, mm. they kept time. Yes. And they were, every 15 minutes, there would be a train mm. or a bus arriving mm. at a particular station. So. How did you deal with the cold, the cold of the uh, UK? Well, I had to dress up, buy warm clothing. But in any case, then we were young people. Yeah. One really was able to tolerate mm. a lot of the cold. Mm. Sometimes even at, in the summer, you mm. go out only in a shorts. Mm. But nowadays, even when I'm in a suit, I go to London, I, I feel cold. Mm. 24 hours, unless I put on the heater. Mm. But in those days when we were young, mm. no, it was very, very pleasurable mm. to be in London. Yeah. Yes. So how long did it take you, because you, you didn't finish your master's in, 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 in Nigeria. Now you went, and it seems that you combined the master's and the PhD there? Well, in fact, when we went to I went to London in the first instance. I registered for an MPhil, mm. Master of Philosophy right. in History. Right. But after one year, the, my supervisors decided that I was good, therefore I should skip the MPhil and go straight and do the PhD. Mm. That is how I came back to Nigeria after one year. Mm to do one year's field, field work, mm. where I collected a lot of stories, mm. a lot of information mm. from both Kano, mm. from Zaria, mm. and from Karuna mm. archives, yes. and as, as well as Arewa House. Mm. Then I went back to London after one year mm. to now start writing my thesis mm. on the history of Kano mm. from 1882 to 1940. Mm. So I went to my school, I reported I'm back. Mm. So how do I go on? He said, well, you are now the expert. <laughs> so unless you write me your first chapter, mm. there is nothing I can do for you. Mm. Ah. And I have never been coached or taught how to write. Mm. So I was stuck. Mm. I did three, four, five months. I could not produce the first chapter. The first chapter. Mm. I did not go to see my supervisor. He kept phoning me. In fact, I decided, I took up a job with a, with a factory, making sweets. Mm until he finally caught up with me and begged me to come for, for God's sake. My study is waiting for me. I said, ah, you said? So we sat for about two, three hours. Then he lectured me on how to go about it, opening paragraph, you know, 
which could be the same, and then we go on, etc. He just taught me pro shortly, in, in a very short time, mm. he made me to have the courage to commence writing my, mm. my, my, my thesis. Mm. So I started. And when I wrote my first chapter, I took it to him. He was very happy. Mm. Then he concentrated. He really improved it so much mm. to my amazement mm. that I was surprised at myself. Mm. And that in fact, made it easy for me to continue writing mm. one chapter after the other until about September. 1972, mm. when I finished the PhD, writing the PhD. Mm. So I am wondering, Ablahi Smith was yes. still then the head of the Department of History, because ABU is known for this ABU school, which is a radical school, as you know, more than me. Yes. With Bala Osman, Mahmoud Tukor, and, and, and many are, Sulebello, who also studied Kano. Most of them are my friends. Yes, but you, you seem not to be in this radical kind of tradition of uh, the ABU? You, you cut your uh, own path. I was a radical, hmm. but a very subdued one. Because <laughs> that is how I was even elected yes. as a member of the ABU Senate, right. representing the congregation, that right. is the, the grassroots teachers. Yes. Yeah. So you are a subdued radical. You, are, you really didn't follow, you didn't quite flow along with Bala Osman. I didn't and go with the extremism of Bala Osman. Mm. But in my own way, in Kano, mm. I was probably the foremost radical mm. at that time. Mm. Because the authorities said students are not allowed to go, go to the staff club. Mm. And me, being a rebel, mm. I will always invite yeah. students yeah. to join me. I said, before God, we are all the same. So yes. why, why should we say you shouldn't come? Yes. Why establish the staff club yes. if our students cannot be our guests? Mm. So that is how my rebellion went. Mm. But it was not ideological. It was, mean, in terms of the ideology or the fashion of having Marxism and all those... No, things. not Marxism. My own was for equality before God and man. Mm. That the students are not, are not small boys. Mm. So why should you prevent them going wherever they want mm. on the campus? Mm. You know? Yeah. So uh, that was very, very fruitful. Mm. We made so many friends. Mm. We are still friends with some of them. Mm. And then Eventually, we, we had an acting head of the department, a Sudanese, mm. who I think after around 19, 1974, mm. when I've just come back one, two years or thereabouts, mm. he issued a Sakura. that Nigerian history will be studied as an option, optional. For those doing history honors, mm. put it on the various boards. Mm. I went and tore it up <laughs> and put it that in my experience, you go to the US, UK, India, every country in the world, Australia, the subject, the history of that country is a compulsory subject for an honors degree in history. Mm. So they will not ag allow a black Sudanese to come and impose three times as second class. Mm. They will not agree. Even Sudan, I've been there. Mm. Th that their history is compulsory. Mm. So we quarreled with him. Mm. So he couldn't pull out my own circular because mm. he was afraid mm. of the reaction of Nigerians. Mm. So. I went to Zaria now to see the vice chancellor to complain. Mm. Ha. The vice chancellor who some years back was so friendly. 
Then when I, my slip went the back, he wrote back that I should write to him through my head of department. Mm. Ha. So I said, okay. I went back to Kano. What I did was promptly to write a letter of resignation. Mm. So I sent it. Make mm. sure that it will expire in six months, notice mm. would expire in, in, in November mm. 74. Mm. The VC went. I went to my Riguri and had interviewed with the Civil Service Commission for a job. Mm. The chairman didn't want, one of the members who is from Borno, didn't want me to move from ABU teaching to the public civil service of Borno. Mm. But the chairman was sympathetic, mm. as well as the governor. Mm. And uh, despite the visit by the vice chancellor, Professor Isha Aouru, mm. the governor was still wanting me to come and work in his office. So the vice chancellor tried to stop you from moving? To from, stop me from, from going to the going, civil service. Because they have spent so much on me mm. in the way of scholarship. Mm. And I have come and told for only one and a half years or so. So you didn't fulfill your own I don't really fulfill yes. the, the minimum requirements. Mm. But that is how I. Left. So, so you left the university rather abruptly. You were a lecturer one. Lecturer one. Uh, did you really intend to stay in the university and become a professor that, before that incident? That was my intention. Student? Yes. But I was put off when the vice chancellor told me to write to him through, through head my head of department. Yes. With whom we were not even on talking terms. Yes. Who, who you are fighting? Yeah. So mm. that made me really so upset. Mm. Then I decided that I better quit hmm. because it's not worth it. Why, why, why didn't you think of going to another university? Because that, that could have been an option. No, as a with a degree from London, PhD, I assume any university would love to have you. No, my ambition was to teach in ABU. Hmm. So once that was frustrated, hmm. I said it's better for me to offer my services to my own people. Hmm. That's all. So ultimately, you left the university, you went to the civil service in Borno. Yes. Which many people will say is, is a big change because the tradition of academia yes. and the civil service are so different. I know, they are mm. very different. But I was welcomed, and my permanent secretary and other colleagues helped me to settle down because mm. I was promptly given accommodation. Mm. So my wife could join me in my degree. Mm. I was given an office as principal assistant secretary mm. in the political affairs department in the governor's office. Mm. So, it was so you are, you another, are another exciting challenge. Yes. So I was very happy. Mm. That was in December '74. Yeah. You went on to serve Borno state government as permanent secretary in uh, virtually every ministry in the state. Not every day, but so, <laughs> so many of the key ministries, mm. like trade and industry, works and housing, element and forest resources, agriculture, finance, and health. Mm. Besides having served as if when I became first permanent secretary in the governor's office, I was in charge of administration and political department, mm. as well as permanent secretary, minister of home affairs and information. Yeah. Is yeah. there anything you did that you think is something that you recall much, much later as your own particular contribution in, Bor in Borno? Well, one of the most controversial mm. fate was even appeared then in the New Nigeria mm. as a sort of scandal. It was that in 1980, mm. as Havana uh, Secretary, Minister of Animal and Forest Resources, mm. I went to Kenya. Kenya? Yes. 
to collect the wildlife that President Jomo Kenyatta donated or gave to the northeastern state mm. when he visited Maiduguri mm. in 1973. So Jomo Kenyatta was in, is in Maiduguri? Was in Maiduguri, Maiduguri, yes. Mm. And that was in 1980. Then I went there. I was taken as a guest of the one of the elephant farms. Mm. That farmer had more than 5,000 elephants mm. in his farm. Mm. So I spent about a month. And the animals are in the wild. They have to be caught and tamed mm. before they were sent. Mm. And when I came back to Nigeria, the news leaked mm. that I'm going to. East Africa to Kenya with 52 million. Nera. To, yes, to, to buy animals. When the, when the 52 million, the 52, it was 52,000 shillings mm. only. Okay. Because Kenya shillings. Yes. Mm. So it was a very cheap thing. Yes. That's including the air freight mm. from Nairobi to Maiduguri. Mm. And uh, among the gift was also a giraffe. Mm. But the giraffe, even after telling, cannot enter the plane. Mm. So by the time the rest of the animals came, we took them to the Caribbean Park, no problem, because they are being acclimatized yes. not to run away from people. But the newspapers, carried a sort of drawing mm. showing that animals in the aircraft and the giraffes <laughs> no, <laughs> pointing out. But yeah. we did not bring the giraffe. Yes. Only that what I did was to send one forest officer mm. to the Zambiza forest. Mm. Why well, we have seen giraffes already mm. that you should go and not come back to Maribuuri, except he brings back a giraffe mm. for the Karimi Park. Mm. So he brought, he went and caught a giraffe and brought it to the park and let it free. Mm. And the giraffe is no use to other animals or people, so it kept running, 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 until he broke his neck. But oh. before, even, before even I came to see mm. or to welcome him, mm. The thing had broken his neck and oh. died. Mm. So that was mm. another yeah. very interesting incident. Mm. So after 10 years in Borno, you moved to the Federal Service. Yes. Was that an invitation for you to move there or you, 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 you tried yourself to, to move? I was in fact forced to move mm. to avoid being uh, retired. Mm. Because by about 19... 70, no, 85. I was virtually the most senior of the palm sex mm. after the secretary of the government. Mm. But following the 19, the Babangira coup. 84. 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 85. Mm. Okay. 85. Yes. So Buhari was yes. toppled. Babangira took over That's 85. Right. Mm. And the governor, then General <coughs> Awokar Waziri, mm. who was a classmate, a townsmate, mm. and a friend, mm. was retired. Mm. So the Secretary of the Government now felt that during the Waziri's time, I had usurped his powers, mm. which is not true. <laughs> you were PAMSEC government house? No, I was PAMSEC fi finance. Finance. So from finance, I was moved to establishments. Mm. After three months, there was another announcement, reshuffle of, palm, of PAMSEC. My name did not appear. So I handed over establishments 
and waited for 10 days. Mm. There was no news. Mm. So I went to the Secretary of the Government. I said, they have taken me away from the stamps and we have issued a circular, but I don't see my name. Mm. So, he said, well, well you see, we have, they wanted to retire you, but there are too many people from Fika who are retired. So the new military governor, then Lieutenant Colonel Amin from Kazina, yeah, said, said we should send you to Bew as sort of administrator of a local government. So that is what prompted me now to expedite action about transfer because I said if Aminu were to be transferred, mm. that Secretary of Government would probably recommend that I should be retired. Mm. And I was only in my 40s. Mm. So I think it worked. So you applied to the Federal Service? I applied to the Federal Service mm. for transfer. Yes. And kept following it up through friends, etc. Yes. And it was okay. But before that happened, nine months after I was in Bill, there was a circular. Mm. As a signal from the Maiduguri that whatever I was doing in Bill, I should leave it and come to Maiduguri. So I came to Maiduguri. The following day, I went to the Secretary of the Government. He said, eh, I am going on leave. And the military governor said, you should come and act as Secretary of the Government. I said, okay, no problem. Mm. So we did have handed over on a Monday. Mm. So he went to start his leave. T three days later, by Wednesday, by the time I came to work, of course, I was working on the co at the conference table rather than the table of the Secretary of the Government. Mm. I found my boss in his seat in the office. He was back. He's back. Mm. I said, what happened? He didn't tell me anything. He just sat there. So we spent six weeks. I was doing the work of the Secretary of the Government at the conference table. My boss was sitting there every day. Until his leave was over, I handed over to him. Maybe he was worried that you you continue the job. I think he is part of the Malams misled him. That if he went away for the six weeks, mm. I would have taken over mm. the job. Yeah. So thereafter, then I went to say goodbye to the military governor. He said, I'm not going to be. I said, well, how? He said, well, uh, I have enjoyed working with you as secretary of the government. Now if you go, that, so he gave, made me parasitic special duties. But Whatever file goes to him from the Secretary of the Government, he will refer it back to me again. So when my transfer now came, the governor said he will not release me. To go to Lagos? To go to Lagos. Yes. Because if I go with whom will he work? Mm. Ha. I said, sir, your job is temporary. If they take you away now, my boss would recommend that I should be retired, and I'm not yet even, even 50. Mm. So I begged him, I took all, to all his friends all over the country mm. before he finally agreed mm. to let me proceed to, to Lagos, mm. which then, but then I did in November 1986. Mm. How was working in Lagos for somebody from... Or no, you, you are used to the environment of Borno. Sadly, or did you find it challenging working in Lagos? It was challenging, but at least one was used to the routine. Mm. In any case, by that time, the same Al Hajaram figure, my namesake, mm. was the head of service. Mm. So I was in his office as his special assistant, mm. pending my posting to a ministry. Mm. And eventually, he, in February, the following year, that is, I think, 87, he posted me to 
Minister of Works and Housing, mm. as Secretary for Administration and Finance. Mm. That's why I went yeah. first. And then I was enjoying my job there. By July, we have worked out, solved the backlog of promotions. Mm. Did you to, enjoy it? Nick, Nick. Nick, yes. Personally, I didn't enjoy it. Mm. Because I didn't like it mm. from the bottom of my heart. Mm. But Professor Awa, to my surprise, he just had so much confidence and faith in me mm. that he kept me very close. Mm. So I had to do my best. Mm. And I became head of recruitment mm. and training. Mm. That way, mm. I had a chance to give a job. Yeah to a lot of acquaintances, which I think many of them mm. are still appreciative mm. up to today. You also had another political job, so to say, or something associated with politics as the clerk of the National Assembly. Yes. yes you, are, you are PAMSEC or DG, but the clerk of the National Assembly. Yes. Dealing with politicians. How did that go? That <coughs> was very rewarding mm. because the Shagari Assembly following the coup in 83, 84 mm. was disbanded. The entire staff was disbanded and humiliated. Mm. So I became the first one now mm. appointed by government to be clerk of the assembly. Mm. And the rest of the staff, I have to employ all of them. Mm. To rebuild the team. From messenger to deputy clerk. So I embarked on that. I could only attract two people from the defunct Shagari National Assembly. Mm. Because I think the treatment they received, I understand, was so bad mm. that not only two are willing or able to accept to come back mm. to serve in the assembly. Mm. So all other vacancies I have to fill. Mm. You stayed there four or five years? I stayed the there club? about four, four years something. Mm. So I stayed there until this ill-fated Third Republic Assembly mm. was convened in December mm. 1992. Mm. When you were made the chairman of the National Assembly Service Commission, yes. was that after retirement or was it a continuation of your civil service career? It was after retirement. Mm. In fact, long after retirement. Yes. Because I was retired 30th April 1999. Mm. Just one month before the General Abdusara Awoka transition ended. Yes. So from that time up until 2013, mm. I was a retired person. Mm. But in the interim, in that period from March 19, 2004, mm. until end of 2019, mm. I was teaching at NIPS, where I rose from study group director to be acting director of studies mm. for six years. Mm. That made me another, gave me another opportunity to, inter, to interact with top civil servants, mm. with top people from <coughs> both the public and private sectors mm. who come to do their courses mm. in order to be made mm. members of the National Institute. Mm. Yeah. What have you been doing since you retired fully? Now, I, I think since the National Assembly Service Commission, yes. you have not been working in a... Uh, no, I, I, yes. I, I have not been working. Yes. But this is from 2018? No, we are doing consultancy. Okay. Myself, Professor Eddie Ahaya, mm. 
and several colleagues mm. who had a company mm. and who used to be invited mm. to do a lot of training and retraining mm. for the top civil servants. Mm. Which Are you still doing that? No, I think the thing has dried up. Mm. So we have if I dissolved the company. Mm. So we have spent about four or five years, mm. no job. Yes. We are keeping paying rent over the office, mm. paying secretary, paying messenger, etc. Mm. So we have dissolved the company. So what do you do in retirement now? Since now? Yes. I just, I just read. Mm. Because I used to, I go to London almost at least once a year. Mm. And among the things I do is I make sure that I go to a bookshop, mm. a very first class bookshop, mm. and buy at least two or three books mm. every time I go. Mm. So that keeps me abreast of mm. politics, mm. current affairs, mm. as well as history. Mm. And uh, I've been enjoying it that way. Besides reading, do, do you have any other hobby, any other activity you do? You do? No. Besides reading, I don't do, I don't do anything, mm. really. How is your typical day from morning to, to, to evening? Well, typical day, mm. I normally wake up around 4.30, mm. say my prayers, and then continue supplicating mm. to God Almighty mm. until 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. Mm. And thereafter, I close mm. the prayer aspects. Mm. And very often, I then go back to bed mm. for about two, three hours mm. before the one o'clock prayer. Mm. That's the pattern every day. Mm. Yeah. For the rest of the day, do you, do you socialize or you just stay at home most of the time? I stay at home most of the time. Mm. Do you do any restrictions on your diet? Is there, is there any particular thing you, you, you eat or you don't eat? No, except pork. Mm. <laughs> I, eat, I, I eat anything. Yes. Because I'm lucky, I've been my weight. Mm. How is family life for you? Family life is okay. Because I'm lucky, I've been blessed with 14 children mm. now, 12 of whom are already graduates mm. and working, mm. mostly here in Abuja. Mm. That gives me a great joy mm. that I have, I have, I have done my part. Mm. So after Uganda, you married again? After Uganda, I married again. Mm. They became two. Mm. At one stage, they became three. Mm. That ultimately, they remain two. Mm. The one, a divorced one. Mm. And the senior wife died in 2009. Mm. But then I have seen them married another one. Mm. So there are still two of them. Mm. Though they don't live in the same house, mm. which now forced me to have two homes. Mm. Yeah. Do you still socialize with friends, uh, your peers, your mates? Do you uh, visit and I socialize? socialize largely through the telephones mm. or when I go to Friday mosque. Mm. I meet with friends like Professor Bajoga mm. and I also talk with friends like Tony Iredia, mm. who was a friend since I was in the hours Electoral Commission we have been tight friends mm. and he lives in Abuja mm. so occasionally he visits me to say hi mm. to, a, to, a, to a dear friend. Mm. Before I had problem in my life we used to travel to Benin with him mm. and often visit Chief Igbenidion Ig mm. who is an uncle of Iredia. Mm. So we used to go there and very often there you you get a lot of generosity mm. from Chief Igbenidion mm. and his son, mm. Lucky Igbenidion, mm. who was one time governor of Bendel or Edo, Edo State. Mm. Yeah. 
So do you travel besides, uh, I mean, do you go to, uh, do you have, you are all links to Uganda, do you travel outside the country now? Or? No, when I was in the commission, yes. Mm. I used to travel outside the country at least three or four times. Mm. And I've been to Uganda mm. several times mm. since then. But most of my travels are just to London, mm. For medical checkup and treatment, mm. and back to Nigeria. Mm. Yeah. What do you make of the country now? I mean, you've seen quite a bit of Nigeria over the years. What is your feeling about the current state of the nation? The current state, I think, instead of the despondency under the previous regime. I think people are now very optimistic and very expectant mm. of a better life mm. under this present regime. Mm. And these people include my humble self. Mm. Despite the problems of we're having with the diesel price, petrol price, mm. labor price, mm. We believe things ought to be better for us mm. in the next four years or eight years. Mm. In particular, we believe the security situation will improve. Mm. Because I have not traveled to Poriskum now for about 10 years mm. because of fear mm. of the dangers along the, by the roadside. Finally, whenever, when I told friends that I'm going to go and interview Adam Ofika, yeah. everybody, the first person that comes to mind is the older Adam Ofika. Yes. I wonder, this, having this name, a name of somebody who is uh, actually a relative and a mentor, has it been a, a, a kind of disadvantage or advantage to you in your career? It has been, I think, an advantage. Mm. Because wherever you go, mm. you have recognition. Mm. Until you explain that the, the old Africa mm. is my teacher, mm. is my relation, mm. and is my is my boss. Mm. But I'm not him. Mm. Except that mm. he is a Haji and I am called Dr. Adam Hitler. Doctor, yes. So that at least differentiates mm. between us somewhat. Mm. But well, you never felt that the name has been a problem for you to, to, to recognize you to, to, or to make you distinct from him? No, it has never been a problem. Mm -hmm. Because the Google has something on people. Mm -hmm. and there's something on me who shows, mm -hmm. gives my background, yes. as we have discussed yes. with you. Yes. Uh, who shows that, yes, I am a smaller figure, but <laughs> I've also done my own yes. contributions yes. to the well-being yes. of some students mm. and of some Nigerians, mm. especially in Borno and Yobe, mm. where some of our projects mm. are still being used. Mm. And I'm very proud mm. to visit Yobe and, and Borno State mm. at any time. Yeah. yeah. Indeed, I, I should say that your contribution is beyond Yobe and Borno. I mean, it's clear from what our viewers have heard that you have traversed the country, you've served in many areas, yes. including the National Electoral Commission, including the National Assembly, and of course, including the Federal Civil Service. Yes. I'd like to thank you for your service to the country and for agreeing to give us this interview. So and much. viewers, uh, until we meet in another edition of Reminiscences, Thank you and goodbye.